Hey, everybody. I am so excited to be with you today, and I want to thank you just for making time. You know, God is up to big things in our world, and it's such a blessing to be a small but very significant part of it, right? And uh, then to have friends that you absolutely love uh, being a part of it with. Today, we're going to be talking about connecting people to purpose. And I am super excited. There's no hyperbole, I promise you, when I say that. Because today, we're going to talk about the fact that connecting people to purpose involves more than finding good membership curriculums. It involves more than finding good leadership classes. Those things are vital, and we'll talk about them some today. But what we're going to see is that there's a spiritual dynamic that's vital if we're going to create a culture where on a continual basis, people come to Christ in our church, they grow into great disciples in our church, and then they grow into leaders within our church that can actually disciple others. We're going to talk about the spiritual component that's vital to that today. And we're going to give you a template for creating that culture within your church. But before we do that, I want you to consider the perspective Jesus developed in the people that he led. In John 14, 12, it says that he looked at his disciples right before uh, going to the cross the night before, and he said, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Wow, we'd all agree that no one's ever done the work of the Father better than Jesus, right? He had the Holy Spirit without measure. But how do we develop within our people the ability to do that work to an even greater degree? Because it can't just be that there's more of us. It also has to be that they have a capacity to do that work. And we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about why the Sanhedrin, who were Israel's most powerful ruling council, looked at Peter and John just two months later. And they were concerned because 3,000 people had come to Christ and now they were part of this rapidly forming Christian community. They thought when they killed Jesus that it would be over, but they found out he had raised up some people who were capable of doing the greater work that he had dreamed about. And the Bible says in Acts 4.13 that when they saw the courage of Peter and John and they realized these were just unschooled, ordinary men, that they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Now, God loves astonishing the world through what he does. But how do we develop within our people that God's given us the opportunity to pastor the kind of courage and the kind of competence that causes God to astonish our community through the work that he does through them? I'm really looking forward to this today, and I'm grateful that I can be joined on this broadcast by my son, uh, Jeffrey Graff. He became our student pastor four years ago at Faith Family Church. And, you know, at first he started by preparing uh, messages for junior high, senior high, and young adults each week. And he had two messages he prepared, and he ministered them three different ways. But in addition to that, he started raising up a team around him. So God wasn't just changing lives through the content that he shared with people, but through the community who was helping him to disciple people. And I can say... Four years later, all three of those environments, junior high, high school, young adults, all of them have quadrupled. And uh, the team hasn't quadrupled, but the team has grown larger and stronger too. So I'm so thrilled that he's with us today. Jeffrey, welcome to Significant Church. Hey, everybody. Good to be with you guys. I'm I'm so glad and thankful that I get to be on this. Um, As you said, my name is Jeffrey. Uh, I oversee our family ministries now, which has been so much fun. That's our nursery, preschool, kids, youth, young adults, junior high. Um, And I've loved it. Uh, As he said, we have been blessed um, that we have, you know, quadrupled in those areas. We've done some things good. I've also done a lot of things not good that I've learned from. Um, I remember just the first winter retreat I ever led for the youth group. One of the kids came up to me, the kids and he said, uh, excuse me, this feels a little bit disorganized. Um, so I just want you to know that I have not done everything right. I don't, you know, know everything, but I hope, you know, that I can share some stuff that's helpful for us. Uh, I think one of the biggest things I have learned is that things don't really go well because you show up and just preach good. Preaching good is awesome and people appreciate when you preach good. But I have learned 
that people don't just care what you can do for them. People care a lot more what we can all do together. And I think when I made that shift in my mind, not just what can I do for people, but what can we all do together, um, it made a big difference. It obviously takes teamwork to do that, which runs into your own set of problems in terms of how do I recruit people? And then once they're here, how do I retain them and, and not lose them? So what I want to do today that we'll, we'll do in a little bit is I want to give you three questions that I always think through in my brain that help me connect people to purpose. There are three questions that if you can ask yourself, and you can answer yes to all three of these questions, you will have a very good shot at connecting people to a greater purpose and accomplishing more. So anyway, I'm super excited. Thank you for having me here today. Um, it's good to be here. Well, good. And uh, first of all, I want to tell you, I like that shirt. Uh, you've always dressed well, but make sure you tell Eden how grateful I am for all the ways she's fixed your life, okay? You, you've always dressed well, I got to admit. Good. But uh, she's been a big part of your journey, and she's gotten her physician, physician's assistant degree at the same time. So she's been one bat, busy gal, and we're, we're proud of mm -hmm. you guys. But before we start, and I cannot wait, because again, we're going to give you a template. And with the template, you're going to be able to attack things that you're attacking, but only, I, I believe, with a lot more significance in your heart and a lot more success and and a lot more just motivation and, and and love for what's going on in your people's heart. But first of all, I want to quickly do two things. First, I want to welcome the new members who've joined Significant Church within the last couple of weeks. Uh, Pastor Gary Barnhart from LaBelle, Florida, Joseph Bryant from Jaw, New Mexico, Stephen Brown, uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland, uh, Jody Cagle from Cartersville, Georgia, Brian Chandler from Santa Ana, California, Tony Cotto from Vineland, New Jersey, Jerry Davis from Harvey, Louisiana, Tim Ferrara from Santan Valley, Arizona, Andy Hill from Longview, Texas, Gary Kraft from Clinton, Missouri, Ed Michael from Dundalk, Maryland, Jerome Spann from Nottingham, Maryland, Terry Vincent from Tulsa, Oklahoma, Wesley Wagnock from Providence, Rhode Island, uh, Alonzo Angulo from San Jose, Costa Rica, and Moises Portello from Camito, Cuba. And uh, guys, we just want to thank you guys for doing all that you do. God's putting great churches all over the world. And it's our joy to build friends who are committed to helping guys all over the world, too. The other thing I want to do is I want to give a partner shout out. Because for those of you who have been part of Significant Church for a long time, you know the passions that drive us. But passions that drive us are nothing without people, right? That's why we're talking about connecting people to purpose today. And the person that I'm going to shout out today, I am so grateful to be connected to because there's nobody who embodies the spirit of significant church more than this person does. He lives to see the significance of every pastor celebrated, to see them find what they need through relationships they greatly enjoy, to see them surrounded by spiritual fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters who help them receive answers to their prayers. And then he really cares about seeing the least reached parts of the world have thriving churches. And I'm talking about Mark Carroll, who has been the pastor of Christian, yeah. Victory Christian Fellowship in Somerset, Kentucky now for 33 years. And the reason Mark is so good at helping pastors and their teams is he has two qualities that are necessary to help pastors and their teams. Number one, he has empathy. And empathy is a lot different than sympathy. Sympathy feels for people, right? But empathy, empathy feels with people. And, and it's just not satisfied if it doesn't help people get to where they really want to go. A lot of people have sympathy for me on the golf course when they watch me. But, but empathy, that's what I'm looking for, somebody who will help me get where I want to go. And the other reason, Mark obviously has a, an ability. So uh, he has passed over his church, passed on the baton to Chris and Chrissy Edwards. And uh, Chris and Chrissy are doing a phenomenal job. The, the ministry is continuing with the same effectiveness in a whole new generation. And that is just beautiful when it happens. At the same time, Mark is now traveling and uh, he's helping other spiritual sons and daughters in different locations. Uh, he's traveling the world and he's ministering to missionaries. So Mark, we just shout you out. Also want to let everybody in the Kentucky area know 
that Mark is having an exchange where lots of good pastors and leaders and their teams are going to come together, and it would be an, a, a great place for you to be refreshed and to find an absolutely great connect. Well, let's get into what we're going to talk about today, and that is how do we connect people to purpose? And there's three things that we need to excel at, and I want to recommend a book today, and I don't do this every time, but this book is called The Power of Positive Leadership. It's written by John Gordon, and it shares how and why positive leaders transform teams and organizations that change the world. And this book certainly spurred some of the thoughts that I'm going to share with you today. And I think it can be a great blessing to you and your teams, as it has been a great blessing to us and our teams here at Faith Family Church. But I want to dive into how Jesus developed the courage and the capacity in the hearts of his followers to do what he did. What did he do that caused them to be such transformers of the world? And I think we can see it clearly in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 to 38. It talks about how at the end of year two, excuse me, in Jesus' ministry, that he went through all the towns and villages. He taught in their synagogues and he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom and he healed every disease and every sickness. Man, what capacity that is, huh? To have the authority and the competency in your ministry that every work of the enemy is being reversed in people's lives as you minister. And Jesus went on and he taught his disciples, listen, I want to help you have that same capacity. And so verse 36 says that after doing that, going to every city and town, healing everybody of everything the enemy had done to people, that it said he saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and they were helpless like sheep who had no shepherd. And that passage so stirred my soul as I read it this week. And I thought about what God's getting ready to do through pastors and through communities he's raised up all over the world. Because in the 1960s, the non-denominational church movement, all these churches that know the Bible and love people, they didn't even exist in our towns. Many of you remember that. But they exist now because God's up to something. And that is he knows that harassed and helpless people can become healed people who heal what's going on in their communities all over the world. And if shepherds and teams develop the same capacity Jesus uh, developed in his followers, something very beautiful is going to happen. It's why Jesus continued in verse 37 and 38, and he requested this of the disciples. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are too few. I want you to ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, I want us to notice first that Jesus wasn't a pessimist, okay? He believed something great could happen in every underserved community of the world. But he wasn't Pollyannish either. He knew the capacity and compassion for those places and courage had to be developed in the hearts of followers before things were going to change. And the same thing is true regarding the calling that God has placed on our hearts and the hearts of the people in our church. I well remember when I began ministry in my early 20s. A really tired pastor took a weekend off to be refreshed and he let me teach in his church. Afterwards, his number two man took me to lunch and he asked me to tell him what God's dream for my life was. I described something similar to what I'm doing today, to which this man replied, that's a big vision for someone I just heard preach the message you did. <laughs> and you know what? He was right. I needed some help. Now, this man had the ministry of discouragement. That's a gift that sees what's wrong but it doesn't know how to fix anything, and there are no rewards in heaven for that. But what happens when somebody with the gift Jesus had steps into people's lives? Well, two things happen. First of all, Jesus helps us believe about ourselves what we would never even believe about ourselves when we think about what we've been through and, and where things are. And then the second thing Jesus does is he develops a competence within us that, that causes us to do what we could have never done if he wanted to work with us. The final thing he wants us to do is not to be so self-focused on ourselves, but he wants us to have compassion so that we do the work he wants done, not just the work that we would do if we had our own way. But how do we get people to this place of competence and courage and compassion? 
Well, there's a template I want to give you today. Three things I want you to think about as you think about your ministries. Number one, it starts with optimism. Optimism is a hope-filled confidence that there will be a successful outcome in a future endeavor. And, you know, how does the cynic view life? Well, the cynic says, I'll believe it when I see it, right? How are we called to view life as believers? We're called to believe to view life this way, that I'm going to believe it because God said it. And because God said it, if I do the right things, I know that I'm going to see it. I know that's the story of how Jesus has worked in my life. It's the story of how he's worked in so many of your lives. Jesus gets things done by believing in people other people wouldn't have believed in like you and me. And then develop, developing them to do things they could have never done if it wasn't for their relationship with him. And he calls us to do the same thing. Walt Disney maximized this skill from a human perspective, didn't he? And I know some don't want to talk about Disney these days, but the truth is he was raised in a Congregationalist church. He had Congregationalist ministers dedicate all of his properties. And uh, he was a man committed to wholesome, clean entertainment for our country. But I, I've always loved this story that I'm sure some of you heard regarding Disney World in Orlando, Florida. The dream was first in Walt Disney's heart. Uh, he had things developed, and sadly, as he was developing them in 1966, he passed away. His brother Roy took over the leadership, and construction began in 1969. And at the three-day opening celebration in Orlando, Florida, Roy Disney, who took over the project, said to Walt Disney's widow, Lillian Marie, Oh, Lillian, I wish Walt was here to see this. To which Lillian replied, hey, Walt did. That's why it's here today, right? And everything starts in the heart of a visionary. That's why God's put the vision he's put in your heart, Pastor. But listen, someone has to believe for it before it turns into what's possible. And that's the first work of a parent, of a pastor, and a spiritual leader of any kind. Do we believe what God is believing about the people who are before us? Now, here's what I want to ask you. Does your new members class communicate that? Do your leadership classes communicate that? Because that's the beginning of the template. If that spirit isn't in them, then they're never going to transform lives, and you're never going to transform a community the way that you're capable of. The second thing that's a part of this template is that belief then has to be turned into competence. And the book, The Power of Positive Leadership, makes this really clear. And I'll admit, when I first read it, I wondered, is this just going to be a feel-good book, or is this going to help us really do good? And uh, what I realized is that the book uses the word positive the way our English language uses it as an adjective. So let me put the definition of positive up. It means to be characterized by the presence or possession of features rather than their absence. In other words, it's a positive that's based on potential. Like I'm positive that you can do this because the capacity to do this is on the inside of you. This is what a lady named Marv Collins had. She started her career in the Chicago public school systems, and she was really passionate about developing undeveloped potential in students. But she saw students being labeled learning disabled that she was convinced they didn't have to be labeled that way. She thought they were, their education was being dumbed down because people weren't optimistic about their futures. And so she uh, examined data, and she came to the point that she truly believed that she could talk these students into overcoming the obstacles that kept them from the belief and from the behavior changes that were keeping them from reaching their potential. And it said that she would put her hand under the chin of these students and she'd say, you're brilliant. I need you to believe that. And she would teach in her one room schoolhouse and pretty soon students were becoming nurses, they were becoming attorneys, some were becoming teachers like her who served underserved communities just like she did. And before she was done, she was honored in the Oval Office by former President George W. Bush and his wife, Laura, as a National Medal of Humanities recipient. But you know what's sad? The school discontinued whenever she quit. 
And it's why God needs so many of us right now to focus not just on what he's put in us, but what are we doing to make sure that it happens not just where we are, but that it happens all over the world? What are we doing to see God's work multiply in this hour? Because think of what Jesus taught in Luke 640, right? He said, the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who's fully trained, everyone who's, who's competent. So we need to be leaders who don't just have curriculums and classes. We need to be leaders who have optimism that the people in front of us have something big God's dreaming about. We need to be Ephesians 1 people, all right? That we're praying for people like Paul did, that the eyes of their heart will be enlightened, that they'll know the hope of the rich calling that God's placed upon their lives. But it can't just be optimism. There's a big job of training and capacity that we have to give ourselves to. And that's why we launched our Leadership Academy this fall. We want the momentum of our weekend services where, you know, probably a couple thousand people this year will come to Christ. About 500 of those people will be baptized in our services. But then what's going to happen? Are those services going to turn into excellence of ministry through the people of our church that creates community and that builds disciples out of these people? Are they just going to make a decision? And that's as far as it's going, going to go. And can I tell you, as I pray about this, it's humbling. It's humbling that so much is possible. If I do a better job, I'm sure you felt that, Pastor. It's also, uh, there's a realization that it's hard work, but I don't want to coast. I want to see God do something bigger than he's ever done in this season of my life. And I know it can happen with this template. Number one, we have to be optimistic like Jesus was. We have to know that, that lives can be healed in a big way. We have to build competency in our teams, however we do that. And yes, it'll take curriculums. And Significant Church has a lot to help you with that in our warehouse, on our website. And we're going to continue doing things to help people. So, so the curriculums, the content's important. But today I'm talking about the spirit. Is the optimism there? is a commitment to making people competent there. Because here's the third thing, we need belief. And belief is defined as a confidence in someone or something. So it's the confidence that someone will succeed because the competence is within them to succeed. They have the competence, they have the compassion, they have the courage, and because of that, God's gonna do something absolutely big in the world. But that competence and that courage and that compassion doesn't happen automatically. We have to develop belief in people like Jesus did. And let's face it, we've all had people who looked at us and said, man, I want you to believe in me. And we're thinking, I'd like to believe more in you. Can you, can you give me a little more to believe in, right? And uh, the reality is we've both seen people like that and we've been that person. And it's because of this process that we're talking about that isn't automatic, that before we can really believe in somebody, we have to excel at the top part of the template. We have to be optimistic. We have to build capacity in people. And then, like Jesus had two years into his ministry, we have the amazing privilege to look at people that we deeply believe in, who after Jesus' death, they astonished the religious world with the things that they did. Now, what happens if, if that doesn't happen? Well, William Bratton was a New York City police chief under Mayor Rudy Giuliani uh, years ago. And in the 1990s, crime was such a problem that people were at a tipping point and they were determined to find somebody to fix it. Of course, Giuliani, Giuliani won the election, but if he failed, they were going to give another mayor the chance. And that motivated Chief Bratton to ask all five borough chiefs of New York City in the police department this question, do you believe crime can be reduced in your area? And three of them said, no, I really don't believe we can overcome all the obstacles. And Bratton said, okay, I'll have to let you go and find some optimistic people that I can develop. And Bratton did. And crime was reduced in New York City in astonishing ways. Why? because he followed the template of Jesus and the template of Jesus works. 
that whenever we're optimistic and we develop our teams, belief is going to come and amazing things are going to happen through the teams that we are optimistic about and that we develop competency in. And here's the bottom line, leaders. Something's going to win. You know, either the fears of our team, the lack of prayer of our team, the lack of discipline of our team, the lack of hard work of our team is going to win or else faith and development and courage and compassion are going to win in our town. So let's do all we can, right, to connect people to purpose, not just the curriculums, but let's connect people to purpose. So, Jeffrey, I can't wait to hear what's on your heart. Yeah, for sure. First of all, thank you. That was so good. Um, it's very hard to connect people to purpose sometimes. And if you're running a church, then obviously a church is a lot of people volunteering their time. So you can't do everything in God's heart just through staff. You have to build teams. You have to connect people to purpose. So with that said, I just have three questions I ask myself when I'm trying to connect people uh, to whatever we're doing. And the first one is this. It's going to sound simple, but I think it's important to ask it. Number one, do they care? And I say that to say sometimes I think we're working hard about something that maybe is like a personal passion thing, but the other people that are around us that we're talking to, they might not care about it. Dad, I just thought about this, and I'll just say it really quick, but one of the funniest stories that you tell is when that one Good Friday you tried to do a blood drive and you were like, <laughs> Jesus gave his blood, so we're going to give ours. And he and my mom gave blood that day. That's about it. Uh, um, because there wasn't buy-in. People didn't care. Now, that's no excuse to not cast vision. Yes, we have to cast vision. We have to let people know why they should care. Um, but I've just realized not everybody's passionate about the same things. I had this guy that really liked me, like we were friends. So he wanted to get involved with youth group. And the more he was there, the more he just didn't like it. And so finally we just had an honest talk and he said, I don't know if like my heart is really passionate about this age group. And I said, okay, well, what is your heart passionate about? He said, man, I just like to pray. I believe in the power of prayer. And he went on and on and he just oozed prayer so we connected him to the intercessor team, and he still serves there. But the first good question to ask is, hey, do they care? Now, the second question, uh, they, all, they all end with C, so hopefully that helps you remember. But the second question isn't just do they care, but a good question to ask is, am I contagious? Because leading things that matter and leading things that are important, that's going to take work. But... Just, and I very much believe this, just because you're working hard doesn't mean you can't have fun. Yeah. And sometimes we don't keep people connected because we're showing up. All right, got a lot to do, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Listen, they don't, they, they don't work for you. They're not getting paid. They just want to have a good time and know that they're making a difference. And I've learned that the hard way. So I, t I tell my team this. Yes, we want things to be excellent, but... If something is truly excellent, it will always include joy. Yeah. So if it doesn't include joy, if it doesn't include, you know, fun and camaraderie, that's a quick way to lose people. And that's just because life happens through relationships. When I was preaching to the youth, it was probably like a year ago, but I made this point. I started the sermon and I said, okay, would you rather go to Six Flags, Fiesta, Texas, which is an amusement park? I said, would you rather go there with your worst enemy or would you rather sit in detention with your best friend? And the whole place is like, detention! We want <laughs> detention! And uh, it's just because the point stands. People want to be with people they like. They want the environment to be contagious. So question one, do they care? Yes. Okay, good. Question two, are you contagious? Are you a leader that good, shows good. up, lights up the room, smiles big? If that's yes, that's great, but it's still not enough. And this is where I think a lot of it breaks down. Do they care? Am I contagious? And last but not least, is it clear? Because you, they can care about it, and you can be contagious, 
But if you don't have a good plan of action and it's not really clear what you're asking people to do, then people who really care will leave frustrated. That's really And good. I've seen this happen a lot. I've I've seen this happen a lot with, you know, maybe an event we put on and the event team will come out and, you know, maybe I'll have a team that's not as prepared and ready to go. So all these people that come and they're ready to, you know, just just get going don't feel like they have direction and they came excited but they leave discouraged and we obviously we don't want that to happen and this book which I also brought uh we've been reading it as a staff it's so good um he talks about how every leader needs to carry a telescope and a microscope and what he means by that is the telescope it sees what's far off it sees vision it sees what can be and man, good leaders carry the telescope. A lot of times, contagious leaders carry the telescope. They're motivating. Woo, look where we can go. However, the telescope's not enough. You also need the microscope. The microscope doesn't show you what can be. The microscope shows you what we're going to do in order to get there. And that's part of bringing clarity to your team, not just bringing a telescope and saying, this is going to be awesome and we're going to do this. But saying, hey, in order to get where I see with this telescope, here's the details. Here's what we got to do. So you got to make sure that you're not just carrying one. Because the truth is, if you're just carrying a microscope, you're probably not contagious. Yeah. But if you're just carrying a telescope, you're probably not clear. And we have to be, we have to be all of those things. So if you want to connect people to purpose, those are just my quick little three questions that I think would be helpful for you to ask yourself. Ask yourself, number one. Do they care about this or am I trying to force something on them that really maybe God didn't even design them to use their giftings towards? Two, am I contagious? Am I having fun? Because they want to have fun. People just do. And then number three, am I making it clear so that I'm not just, you know, over tasking and under training or, you know, giving no resources to do it. But I think if you can answer uh, all three of those questions with a yes, I think it's going to be a lot uh, easier and you'll have a lot more success connecting people to purpose. So, Wow, that was great. Man, I appreciated that. And Jeffrey, I want to add something to, you added something to the book, all right? Because he talked about the telescope and the microscope, but you added the kaleidoscope. I, I don't know if that's accurate or not. <laughs> what, what I'm saying is you got to have a, a compelling vision. You got to have a great culture. You know, I'm thinking about like a party, you know, and then you've got to have the, the comprehensive plan, which honestly, the comprehensive plan is the hard part. But there are times in my leadership where, man, I wish I could go back. You can't you can't go back and begin again, but you can start where you're at to a brand new end. And uh, that's important for us to know as pastors because we get tired. It's the reason we need to take sabbaticals from time to time to make sure we don't get lost in the compelling, in the comprehensive plan for those of you that are kind of leaders that plan and work hard like that. And you and you got to work more on the emotional side. So anyway, I hope that helped you guys uh, today. Uh, we love to do this final part, and you guys know we commit to 45 minutes because we want this to be like a lunch break for you. You can eat, you can gather your staff together and eat, and this can, can help you guys uh, think through things going on in your team. But we have four questions that we've been asked, and uh, Jeffrey, I'm going to let you start on each one, and then I'll, I'll finish after you share your thoughts. The first one is, what advice would you give a pastor who wants to lead people from serving out of obligation to serving out of a sense of purpose. Okay, so I'm I'm going to steal your words a little bit. So if you need to expound them and make them better, then please feel free. Uh, but one thing that our pastor, my dad, always tells us is he says, listen, ministry should produce passion in you, not pressure on you. And I think a lot of times when you start doing things out of obligation, it's good to stop and say, what outside pressures am I allowing to weigh on me? And are they healthy pressures? Are they pressures that God would have me, you know, take on? Are they pressures from other people that I need to stop caring about so much? And then, um, to be honest, the only way I can do that is through prayer. <laughs> you got to keep your prayer life strong to the point where it's like, okay, I'm not focusing on the outside pressure. I need God to restore that inside passion. Um, but I want to, I want to stop short because out of all the questions, I probably have least to say on this one. 
And so you probably can say something better yeah, and more wise yeah. than me. So well, the only thing I'd add to, to the, yeah, the only thing I'd add to that is uh, focus on empower and guard yourself from exasperation. I'm, I'm going to be the first to say I was raised in a pretty uh, exasperating environment as a kid from the perspective that we were disciplined. We we were good athletes. We won lots of games. We had scholarships in college. But the thing that that I wish I'd done better as a father, well, two things. Number one, I wish I had hit Jeffrey a lot less and Michael a lot less when I was throwing batting practice. (laughs) But I I hurt my rotator cuff, and so those guys got beamed a lot taking batting practice. But the other thing is is it's just so much more fun to empower people and to celebrate every little step of progress. So that's my piece of advice, and that is focus on empowering and resist a spirit of exasperation that can easily... Uh, overtake environments. Here's number two, G. I love the idea on connecting people to purpose, but recruiting hasn't been a strength of our church. Do you have any tips to develop as a recruiter? Yes, I got two things to say on this. First of all is you can recruit one of two ways. You can recruit with vision and by telling people vision, or you can recruit by telling people about the problems and that you need them. And so something that I always tell, you know, my staff is like, when you're going, you can frame this one of two ways. You can say, man, we, we just don't have enough workers. We, we really need help. Would you consider? That's kind of scary. And people are like, uh, I feel like I'm stepping into something I don't want to step in. The flip side of that is recruit with vision and be like, man, we have so many kids that are pouring through these doors that are excited to be here that. It's just we're trying to get all the leaders we can to make sure their experience is awesome. It's fun and what God can do through this. So it's like ask yourself, am I recruiting from vision or am I recruiting just by spilling problems? The second thing is don't just see yourself as the only recruiter. Develop a culture of recruitment. I tell my team all the time, you know, like I've recruited as many people as I can think of, but you know people I don't. You have relationships with people I don't. We tell congregations to be a bringer. I tell teams to, you know, be a recruiter. Uh, So I would just instill that culture of recruitment to your teams as well, because you might not know somebody or you might not have relationship with anybody that you can think of off the top of your head, but they might. And if you give them that empowerment, like, hey, I want you to bring somebody that you think would do well there and tell them you think that they do well here. I think that helps recruiting. Uh, That's really good. And I want to add to that that, you know, we do vision casting and recruiting uh, in our services, right? And we do it at our heart for the houses. But to me, two minutes of every service, I don't even call it taking the offering. I do from time to time explain to people that tithes and offerings are how God funds what's on his heart. But man, we talk about vision all the time. We, we, We answer the question of why through sharing testimonies in the church. We take scriptures and and make the why of the church clear in the hearts of the people. And I only give myself two minutes every service to do it. But that means that in 52 weeks on Sunday morning and Wednesday night, that I have an opportunity to share on vision for 208 minutes. And if I don't have a church that's visionary and fired up, then I'm not using those 208 minutes if I did the math right (laughs) very well. Uh, The second thing then is the heart for the houses are where we go from uh, the compelling vision or the telescope into the kaleidoscope, which is the, the, and I just made that up, but it's that culture. I love being with these people and the comprehensive plan. Is it clear in the hearts of our leaders Whenever those three times a year we gather in in heart to house and heart for the house and we gather for the purpose of seeing the momentum of our weekend services turn into excellence of ministry and community that really disciples people. Okay, G, here's our next question. I can motivate people well, but they often fall through the cracks because we struggle to have opportunities or structure for them to connect to. Do you have any advice? Yeah, I think this is something I learned very quickly. Um, don't sh- don't create structure for something you can't sustain. And um, a huge part of that is I will not recruit to anything I don't have a leader for. Because if I do, what ends up happening is I end up trying to oversee all these things, and I can't spin plates and bring 
the vision to that area and the coaching to that area. So if I can't sustain it, I don't even try to structure it. And if I don't have a leader for it, I don't even try to recruit to it, which kind of raises the question of, okay, what's important. And so when I structure stuff, I think what is my highest priority of things I can invite people to be a part of? And I'll tell you how I did it with you. There's something called the hedgehog principle. It's an old story of a fox and a hedgehog. And the fox was good at a lot of things. He was faster. He was quicker. He was smarter. But the hedgehog was really good at one thing. He was good at rolling up into a ball and being pokey. <laughs> so the fox could never beat the hedgehog because the hedgehog did one thing really well. And so the principle is know what you do really well. I told my team, in our youth group, we have three spikes. We're the hedgehog and we have three spikes. Serving opportunities, services, and small groups. So if it doesn't really fall under that, I don't really care to do it. And so I think part of creating a good structure is saying, what can I sustain and what is the most important for me to build things around, if that makes sense? It makes a lot of sense, and it's really good. I, uh, I'm i going to go a different direction on this one because the truth is I don't have anything to add to that. But I do want to say that uh, this is just a whole other principle we're going to throw in. I remember I had a creative team that was very creative, but it lacked some structure in years ago. And they wanted to do this campaign with our billboards and with things where we had this website where people were telling their stories. And so the power of story was going to take over our community. The problem was nobody planned on how the website would be maintained and all the things that were going on. <laughs> and it wasn't long until that just turned into a big mess. Now, if I'm honest as a leader, I wondered it before they started. I even addressed it before they started, but I let them do it. You said, why'd you let them do it if you thought they were going to fail? Well, it's because we run at the speed of relationships, not the speed of being right. If you're right about everything mm -hmm. all the time, people are going to get sick of working with you. But if that, that optimism, that belief in people, that saying, hey, you're brilliant, hey, let's go for it. And then when it falls down, hey, we can learn a lesson now. And so I just want to encourage those of you who are out there that for all these things that are going wrong, and this is, you know, this is like my 12-step class. I am Jim Graff, and I'm going to tell you <laughs> <laughs> where I needed to, to get some help. And that is optimism has to be the foundation as we're putting the confidence in people so that we really believe that this team is going to transform our community in some beautiful and significant ways. All right, Jeff, here we go for the final one. And that is, do you have any more book recommendations about connecting people to purpose? Um, yes. One of the best books I've read in the last few years is called Multipliers. It's by Liz Wiseman. And basically, the whole book talks about as a leader, you can be a multiplier or you can be a diminisher. And it's all about how uh, it's so many case studies of so many like businesses and companies and uh, even nonprofits of where things really took off and people did get connected and felt a part of the vision uh, because there was a leader who multiplied, meaning multiplied the genius in the room. In other words, I'm leading this not because I'm the expert. I'm leading this because I'm the best at pulling out what's in each person. Uh, and it just gives you practical principles to ask yourself, okay, am I diminishing the gifts in the room or am I multiplying them? And uh, it's been one of the most helpful reads for me in helping people go from consumer to contributor because people want to contribute. They just need someone to help bring out their genius. That's and good. that book is super good. That's very, very good. I'm going to suggest a book called Primal Leadership. Years ago, Ron Luce uh, gave me the opportunity. I was with him, and we got to meet the guy who trains our uh, future leaders at West Point. And I asked him what, his, uh, what he thought the best book on leadership ever was, and he said it's a book called Primal Leadership. And it causes you to develop leaders who, when people feel like they're in a foxhole, this is the guy I want to follow. So there are six principles in that book that we built our six laws around. We may make that a show at some point, but it's a tremendous read, Primal Leadership. But hey, we're down to our last 45 seconds, and I want to thank you for being with us this week. And I want to let you know in two weeks, we're going to discuss the pitfalls of the people-pleasing pastor. And we're going to share things that when you understand the pitfall, you're not going to want to fall into that trap anymore. We're also going to show you something better to do about it Pastor uh, Pat Murray is going to be with us, going to have a great time. 
But until then, just know we're praying for God to do great things in your church. We get excited when you tell us about great things that are going on. And we're so glad that uh, God has connected us. Hope you guys have a fantastic weekend.